Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 23rd, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post a podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what the governor should, and likely on the other hand will, do with the budgets the legislature has sent him, and what the difference is between those two. Second, we use a recent Twitter exchange to explain how some think about how, in their words, a reasonable PFD should be determined, and how that differs significantly from Governor Hammond's vision. Third, we discuss the current status of Santos Pica project and whether there's a silent but sitting behind their recent positive statements. And now, let's join Michael. Let's start let's just uh, let's just start things off this morning. First things first. Uh, we saw this quote from the governor. Uh, it was carried by the Fairbanks Daily News Miner specifically. And uh, I had a whole conversation about this yesterday, uh, which was the, uh, you know, the budget and the governor's comment of, well, I think that the spending is right where the people of Alaska expected it, you know, have expectations or what I, I did. And I just looked at the quote and I was just like, what? I mean, this is the largest budget we've seen. I mean, it is huge. It's unsustainable. But this is the level of expectation, the governor says, which I am afraid does not bode well. For the idea that Showers and other have said that, well, we passed the budget with the expectation that the governor is going to use the red pen. And based on that statement alone, I think that that might be folly. What say you, my friend? Well, I got to admit, Michael, I was surprised to see the governor's statement. I, uh, I think he would, um, he's got to, he's got to start being concerned about Charlie Pierce. Uh, And, and I would think that this opportunity to veto some of the stuff in the budget uh, would be one that he would want to take to demonstrate that he's still a fiscal conservative. I mean, th- this budget, I did some calculations and they're in my column that I did for the Alaska landmine last Friday. Um, but this budget is, uh, you got to look at, you got to look at two budgets. You got to look at FY 22 uh, and what they did to this, um, what they did on the supplemental to FY 22 uh, and FY and then FY 23, the FY 22 budget uh, was increased by 25%. Uh, it was increased by a billion dollars, uh, well, a little bit less than 25%, but it increased by a billion dollars from where FY22, from where the FY22 budget was left just a year ago. So, so get this in mind, FY22 in the legislative session of, of 21, uh, spring of 21, they pass a budget of about $4.6 billion. They come back this year, a year later, and they add a billion dollars to that budget alone, <laughs> a budget that the year before they'd said a year fiscal year, if they said the year before was fine at $4.6 billion, they come back and they pile on a billion dollars uh, on that, uh, on that budget alone. And then the FY 23 budget uh, is, is even higher than that. The FY 23 budget is, is around 25%. I think the FY 22 budget is like 22%. And the FY23 budget is 25% um, in, uh, increase. The FY23 budget is, F, is a 25% increase over the five-year average uh, of, the, uh, of the preceding years. Those are huge increases. Huge. Um, I mean, and, and, it's a billion for, dollars. I mean, it's, it's a billion dollars over last year's. That's huge. 
when you're adding a billion dollars to the already settled budget. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, you you, you leave you leave Juno and you say, okay, four point six. That's about the right number for for fiscal year twenty two. You come back a year later. And just because some spare money is sitting around, you go, oh, well, wait, wait, you know, we, we were wrong. That was, It wasn't 4.6, it's really 5.6. That's the right number for, for FY22. And then, and then you layer on FY23 uh, on top of that. So that's a, that's a 25% increase. Um, uh, you combine the two years, take that against the average of the, of the prior five years. That's a 25% increase um, in spending. Now the thing, so so that's unsustainable, right? We can't we can't continue at these five plus billion dollar levels, even if oil stayed at the at the price levels that are currently projected in the futures market. We can't stay at that level. So that doesn't satisfy the definition of sustainability. What I'm concerned about is even if you strip out all of the one time items uh, in the budget, I'm still doing the calculations on this, but if you still strip out all the one time items in the budget. I think we're still uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.8, 4.9 billion dollars on a long-term basis, and we can't sustain that when you right. look at the when you look at the at the current prices in the futures market. So I don't know. I don't know what the governor. I don't know what the, what the governor has in mind when he says this is about the spending that Alaskans want. Alaskans want this is you know this is this is a, a, a satisfactory budget. Um, I mean, he's clearly signaling he's not going to be you know, vetoing much. I don't know what he has in mind uh, about about what you know what he's saying about the budget. It's not sustainable. On a if you look at this budget and you would just assume and, and you just take this number and go forward with it, it's not sustainable on that basis. Even if you strip out all the one time items and get down to what the continuing impact is, I don't think it's sustainable on that basis. So I don't know. I don't know what he's what he, what what he has in mind, um, and and frankly, you know, if if that's where he goes, if he doesn't veto, uh, I think he's just given Charlie Pierce a uh, a campaign issue that uh, that that Pierce is going to run all day long on. I mean, yeah, it's, no, it, it 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 is it is fiscally irresponsible to 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 say. That that this is a budget that we can continue to live on. This is a budget that uh, that that we want, and I, I, I it's not a budget we can pay for. So right, I, I don't know. I don't know where he's going with that. Well, and interestingly enough, something that Don Ardwin brings up in the chat room, which I hadn't even considered, is the time factor here. The supplemental budget uh, over a billion dollars. It's basically one billion dollars for a month because this is last. This is this last fiscal. We're in the last waning month. Uh, or you know, month, six weeks of the thing. Do they have to go back and spend it all, or encumber all that money and do all that? I mean, there's a time factor here as well that makes it kind of ridiculous. Unless it's money that's already been expended, in which case you'd say, who gave the authority to expend a billion dollars more than the budget called for? No, it's not really that. I mean, a, a bunch of it is stuffing is stuffing money into uh, into various. Uh, uh, quasi savings accounts. So for example, there's a bunch of money that's going into the oil and gas tax credit. Uh, that is that is in part to cover the FY22 tax credits uh, as they as they come out of uh, as they as we deal with higher oil prices. Some of it is sort of forward funding of oil and gas tax credits and there's several things like that. And capital authorizations, I mean a bunch of it is capital. Capital authorizations are authorized in one year. But they can be spent up to five years uh, uh, and, and renewed after that. They can right. be spent up to five years uh, after that. So, yeah, it, it sort of if it were operating, if it were if it were all in the operating agencies, then you'd say, oh my gosh, you know, they're going to have to flood the flood flood a bunch of money out there. But that's not really what's going on. Right. The way that uh, this is socking more money away in the designated accounts instead of the dedicated funds accounts, kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, you know, this is. I don't know why I'm surprised, Brad, but I continually am disappointed with the direction the governor has taken since 2019. Um, you know, he came out strong and he took his licks. And we understand that it was probably very painful for him personally and professionally to have the whole, what seemed like the whole world, um, you know, come down on him for these apocalyptic and draconian cut, which was only what seven, six percent, seven percent of the overall budget. You thought that they basically had been, you know, sacrificing children in the street or something, um, which ended up, of course, 
not even being a cut at all. It was actually, we actually spent more than the proposed budget when it was all said and done. Um, but I understand taking a look, but this is just disappointing when he looks straight in the camera and says, this is the kind of budget Alaskans have come to expect. Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't expect a budget to be larger. I didn't expect a billion additional dollars to go into last year's budget. It's unsustainable, period. Yeah, and and I think it provides some good opportunities. I mean, we still have the six hundred the six hundred thousand dollars for the for the damn diving boards, the Diamond High School diving boards in this budget. There are things in this budget that you can go in, you can say, look, you know, the, 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 we we shouldn't be spending on money money on this. We should either be you know saving it or we should be you know putting it in the PFD. I mean, the PFD the PFD is still cut uh, over these two years. The PFD it doesn't even reach. When you look at it over the two years, which is really what you need to do with this budget, because they put so much back in FY 2022, when you look at it over the two years, the PFD doesn't e- doesn't even equal POMV 5050. I mean, it's it, it it's a little bit above that for FY 23, but it's way below that for FY 22. They didn't put any money back into the FY 22 PFD. Right. So so you've got you've got a budget that a two year budget that is still short, even on the governor's own compromise of POMV 5050 um, and and you're spending and you're spending things like you know six hundred thousand dollars for the diamond high school diving boards it's, right he's got things in there that he ought to be targeting and say and say look you know th- th- this is not the time to be to be spending on these things yes oil's up but you know the futures market tells us oil's going to go back down we haven't met our our obligations to Alaskans in terms of the PFD uh, and 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 veto some stuff in there, but right, you know the 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 pushback I get on that is 2019 scar the experience of 2019 scarred the governor. He's not going to go down the road of of cutting things. He's going to sort of let the legislature dictate um, uh, spending levels, and uh, and you know and he's going to say things like this is the budget that Alaskans expect. So I. I, I I just think he's handing I, I think he's handing a campaign issue to Charlie Pierce that, uh, that, that uh, and, Charlie's going to continue to drive home and drive home. And I, I would agree with that. Uh, final thought on this: um, How much do you think he's going to cut? I mean, we've got forward funding for schools, we got the diving boards, we got all these other kind of things. What do you, is, is going to be anything substantive in your mind? Oh, uh, forward funding for schools really doesn't. I mean, it, he could veto that, but it's just going to upset the NEA or the the K through twelve education complex and I, I i don't think it really gains him uh, all that much I, he's he really needs to go into the capital budget and into the operating budget uh stuff that's 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 being added over the long term and, uh, yeah. and find some things there what do you think of this pick uh by dunleavy brad i mean you've been following these things for quite a while um i i say uninspired i say it doesn't move the needle at all uh, i'll be honest i'm shocked that it was not a legislator i don't know why he waited so long but what's your take on this oh i think it's i think it's safe i think it's the i think it's i think it's representative of, of the of this governor since 2019 when he got the pushback uh on uh, uh on on spending everything since then has been safe it's been the safe choice it's been the the pre-polled um, you're not going to, you're not going to upset that many people if you do this, uh, choice. And I think, uh, Nancy's been low key enough. Uh, she wasn't early in her career, but I think, uh, over the last uh, decade, she's been low key enough, uh, that, uh, that I think it's the safe choice. I mean, uh, Dina Bishop would have been a, would have been a, a more inspired choice. It would have been a more, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, rousing choice. Uh, I think it would have uh, brought in some people that the governor otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Uh, but Nancy's, you know, Nancy's the safe choice. I mean, the governor, the governor is going to try to, you know, plow through based upon, um, <laughs> oddly, given what happened in 2019, but he's going to try to plow through going, you know, not going to rock the boat too much. Yeah. You know, the legislature wants to spend all yeah, this but- money. I'm going to fight for That's- your PFD, but not too hard. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that, and I'm going to you know, sort of keep on going down that track. And I think Nancy's just, you know, in line with that. It's a safe choice. I, I got to I got to agree with Matt, though. You know, I mean, safe from one perspective, but I think it ensures that he loses because, again, it does not move the needle. It does nothing to inspire people who were behind him in the beginning. He has done nothing to change that perspective of the 20, you know, the change in 2019. 
So it does nothing. It does not move the needle. It's the safe choice from one perspective because it's unoffensive, but at the other at the other hand, he doesn't gain anything from it. So it's it's you know it, it, lukewarm at best. It's all geared, Michael. This is all geared to rank choice voting. This is, I mean, clearly the governor is going to make the top four. Um, so it's all geared to rank choice voting in the end. And and you know, you think about Charlie out here on one side. Uh, you think about Walker on the other side. You think about Less um, uh, on on another side. And the question is, how does the how does the governor position himself to come through in rank choice? And um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, he's trying to play the middle, the middle of the fairway. He's trying to, you know, just not, not, not over swing, not, you know, run, run the risk of, of putting the ball off into the rough, you know, maybe not get 350 yards on the drive, but not put the ball over into the rough, just keep, you know, sort of inching down the middle of the fairway. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's how they're playing rank choice. Whether that works in the end, uh, we're up, I don't know. We're up against time here, but I mean, real quick, I guess some people's theory is that if you shoot for number two, you have a better chance of winning in rank choice. Is that what you're saying here? Yeah. Um, num- number two on a lot of people's ballots. So number two yeah. on Charlie Pierce's ballot, uh, uh, maybe number two on Walker's ballot. I, I just, I, yeah, yeah, I think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to be safe. Disappointing, I guess. <laughs> it's all disappointed. Uh, that is kind of where I'm at right now. Final thoughts here on the end of the session, where we're going, the budgets, and what does it mean for this next election cycle here that we're in right now with all the all the big races that are about to come down? Well, I'm concerned that uh, that we that this budget leaves us uh, headed toward another fiscal cliff that uh, we haven't got spending under control the past decade of, of the lessons that we that we were continually reminded of that we have limited resources we need to limit our spending as a result of that those have all sorts of gone out those have all sort of gone out the window i'm concerned that we've reset the platform for spending going forward at a higher level than than where we had it not only have we spent more this year in terms of capital budget in terms of stuffing various accounts uh, but we've reset sort of the platform and the operating budget and other ongoing expenses at a higher level. And I think we've got a governor who's just going to go along with that um, and, uh, and, and let that play out. And I, and, and I'm concerned about where that plays out. I mean, he's trying to fund part of it by cutting down to POMB 50, 50. Uh, That's dependent on oil prices. It's dependent on oil production. If neither of those play out, uh, then, then, you know, we've got a governor who's indicated that he has what I, what some used to call in the corporate world round heels, which means he'll back up. He'll, right. he'll, he'll, he'll give way. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe this is a governor who says, ah, I, I tried for POMB 50, 50, but you know, I didn't get there. Um, and so, you know, maybe POMB 25, 75, maybe that's the right landing spot. We, I, I'm concerned that we've lost track on, on drawing a line under spending saying no more uh, and drawing a line under the PFD and saying no more compromises. I'm, I'm concerned that we're just we're wandering away from that. Well, and I, and I think you make a I think you make a valid point that as he does these things and as he as he stays more in the middle and remains lukewarm, that uh, it does open up the possibility for somebody like Charlie Pierce, who was kind of an outsider to begin with, but more and more is starting to look like the conservative choice of all the choices that are up there uh, on the on the real ballot. I mean, uh, it, you know, what what do you? You, you're going to give me some Vegas odds on what you think is going to happen with uh, between that. I mean, you've got the two, you know, you got the two progressive candidates. You've got the real progressive Les Guerra and the quasi wishy washy Bill Walker, and then you've got Mike Dunleavy and Les Guerra. There are other people in the race, but let's face it: uh, of the four, those I think are the four that are going to end up on the ballot uh, in the ranking when it's all said and done. You want to give me some odds? Well, uh, no, I don't want to give you odds because I, I don't have a good feel for it right now. But I think, I think that uh, I think that Dunleavy's playing it. I will say this: I think Dunleavy's playing it too cautious. I think he's sort of lost his edge as as the guy who's going to drive the state fiscal policy, drive the state toward a a, a more secure future. I think he's lost his edge on that. Um, I think I think he's giving Charlie just sort of stood there, right? And I think Dunleavy moved away. From being from being that 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 caught that that fiscal conservative, um, and I think he's sort of given that to, to Charlie. Now, does Charlie translate that into fifty one percent of votes after ranked choice? 
Uh, I don't know. Or does Dunleavy trans, uh, translate his into 51% after rank choice? I don't know. But, it's, but, but Dunleavy, is, Dunleavy is giving up, I think, on being the fiscal conservative he ran on in 2018. I think he's just trying to you know, position himself now as the cautious choice, as the, as the careful choice, as the, the safe as choice. the middle of yeah. the road choice, the safe choice. There yeah, go. yeah. Well, um, and unfortunately, I don't think that's what people want. Uh, I, think, I think we're sick and tired of the safe choice because the safe choice keeps taking us down the road uh, to where we don't want to be. All right, well, let's move on to number two uh, of our weekly top three, the number two discussion, and that is the, uh, you know, this reasonableness question, this PFD. Uh, you put out a story in the landmine talking about reasonable pfds and you got some pushback on twitter on this give us uh, give us your take on this we'll get started before we go to break well i've i've found very interesting uh some of the recent pushback i've got on pfd issues i write a lot about the pfd in my friday uh landmine columns and uh and increasingly i'm getting pushback and people are saying like i'm for a reasonable pfd um and in reasonable government spending and you know Keith Lee's uh, over over you know overdoing it by talking about statutory PFDs or even talking about POMB fifty fifty, and I'm beginning to get a sense, uh, and and maybe I'm the last in the world, but I'm beginning to get a sense about what people mean when they talk about reasonable PFDs, uh, and I think it's I think it's worth talking about here, and I think it's something that I'm going to be writing more about uh, in the landmine because I it it it, it is. It discloses your income bracket, frankly, when when you talk about a reasonable PFD. And I'll explain why uh, when we get back uh, on the other side of the break. We're continuing the weekly top three. We are in the middle of number two, which was a discussion on what is a uh, reasonable, in air quotes, uh, PFD. Uh, Brad, and you say that that's all a function of where you're at and what your income is. Yeah. So I've gotten a lot of a lot of pushback recently on on PFD comments um, with with responses that go to something like this. This is what I got on Twitter the other day. Uh, I'm in favor of a reasonable PFD plus troopers, power plants, water treatment uh, is something I could get behind. Is was was one Twitter comment I got it, after criticizing. That was the second Twitter tweet. The first one was criticizing the article where I was arguing for. Uh, a statutory PFD, and I was calling uh, things uh, uh, levels below the statutory PFD PFD cuts, and 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 the response was, "I'm for a reasonable PFD." And the reason I noticed this one is, this got a bunch of likes on it from Andrew Halcrow, from Joel Hall, uh, from from various people around the state, uh, all of who were sort of chiming in, saying, "Yeah, that's a reasonable PFD." What I've come to realize. Uh, and maybe this is not any great revelation, but but it sort of dawned on me over time. What I've come to realize is when people say I'm in favor of a reasonable PFD, what they mean is this: they mean I'm in favor of a PFD that allows the kind of spending I want, the level of government spending I want, without me having to pay taxes. That's that's the that's the PFD that's the PFD I want, and that's a reasonable PFD. So if you're so if you're if you're t- if you tend to like government and the and the person who made that tweet is a professor at UAF, if you tend to like government and tend to want government, a reasonable PFD to you is one that allows for fairly high government spending levels. Plus, since I'm in the top twenty percent, as that as that person who made the tweet was, plus if I'm in the top twenty percent, I don't want to pay taxes to support those government spending levels. Right. So, so a reasonable PFD to me is a fairly low PFD, like a 2575 PFD that leaves a lot of money for the government spending I like, uh, but, but you know, I don't have to pay taxes for it. The governor talks about a reasonable PFD. Governor Dunleavy talks about a reasonable P- PFD, and he talks about POMV 5050. So what he's talking about, so what that is, is a little bit lower level of government spending than the POMV 2575 people are, a little bit lower level of government spending. Uh, but again, I don't have to pay taxes. And, 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 and this whole reasonable PFD approach is being based on what level of government spending I want, personally want, um, uh, as long as I don't have to pay taxes. 
And you know, for those who want larger government, it's POMB 2575. For those who are willing to put up with a re with a, a given level of government spending, about the level of government spending we've been having for the last several years, it's POMB 5050 because that'll sort of pay for the level of government spending I want without having taxes. Um, and that's and, and that's what those that's what they mean when they say a reasonable PFD. They're not coming at it anywhere close to, to, to the way Hammond came at it, which is what's a reasonable share between government and, and Alaska citizens of, of this windfall we get out of Alaska owning the mineral resource. I mean, that was Governor Hammond's approach, right? Governor Hammond's approach was we're getting this, this windfall out of, out, of, out, of, out of oil, out of oil uh, minerals, mineral royalty. We're putting that into an investment fund. That investment fund is spend, spending off money. What's a reasonable share of, 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 the, of the revenues from that, from those earnings between government and Alaskans? That was Hammond's approach. And it's my approach, frankly, uh, as somebody who comes from the lower 48 and understands oil royalties, understands the private sector oil royalties. But, but that's not what people are, when people use the term reasonable PFD now, they're looking at it entirely from the blinders of what size government do I want? And I don't want to pay taxes. So get, what's the amount of leftover PFD after the, after, after the government I want? What's the amount of leftover PFD um, so that I don't have to pay taxes? And that's how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to define uh, a reasonable PFD. It's, and it, it entirely depends on two functions. One is what size government do I want? And two, I don't want to pay taxes for what, whatever the heck the size government it is. So what's the leftover PFD after I get that? Well, and my favorite thing on this whole thing is the, I'm going to say almost arrogance and disdain of the rest of the tweet, because he goes on to say, uh, while I agree that the poor benefit more from a larger PFD, they also benefit from investments in stuff, which is kind of this, elitist disdainful like oh well, they'll put, leave that let them eat cake it also reminds me yesterday we had spike cohen on and he quoted harry brown back in the day like government is the one that comes in breaks takes all your money breaks both your legs buys you a pair of crutches with your money gives them to you and says look where you'd be without us kind of thing i mean the reason that many of these people need these benefits and these dependency systems that we have in place is because you continue to cut their legs out from underneath of them by taking the pfd yeah, it's the whole Ivy Sponholtz. I mean, we talked about this last week. It's the whole Ivy Sponholtz attitude of we know better than you do about how to spend your money. So we're going to take your money. I mean, <laughs> uh, let's understand this. We're taking money from the poor. We're taking money from, from low income and lower income Alaska families, a huge amount of money uh, as a share of their income. We're taking money from them and telling them, don't worry about that because we're giving it back, back to you in services. The chief service of which is Medicaid. And the money there doesn't go to them. It goes to the docs. It goes to the, to the medical industrial complex. So it's, it's, um, it, 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 it is, it is just uh, elitist is the right word. Um, uh, government centric is the right word. N personal, you know, uh, recognizing that the PFD is a windfall. And the question should be, how do we share that between Alaskans and and government, none of them recognize that. It's just how much, how much can we give you? How much can we bring into government and then give back to you without having taxes? Right. And again, looking at the likes on this comment, I had to laugh because you're right. It's Joel Hall. It's Andrew Halkroll. It's Scott Kendall. I mean, these are the people, these are the poster children for pro big government spend and protecting government spend against, uh, you know, uh, above everything else. Um, and so that is exactly what we're talking about, that kind of mentality and that kind of attitude. Um, and it's, it's frustrating because again, every time you hear the, every time it's like reasonable and Brad, I know this isn't your thing, but it's every time I hear the word, well, we need to talk about reasonable gun control, reasonable gun safety. Well, what's reasonable to you may not be reasonable to me, you know, kind of thing. And that's what it all comes down to. Their idea of reasonable is the smallest amount possible to keep you from squawking so the government can continue to pay. Yep. And it's just, it's completely antithetical. I mean, I've, I've, I have, I, I, I came, I come to this issue from, from years and years and years spent in dealing with lower 48 royalty issues, right? And, and lower 48 royalty issues are, 
the the private landowner gets a share of the of the mineral wealth. That's one of the benefits uh, of of you know owning land that has minerals underneath it. You get a share of the benefits of the mineral wealth, and it's not it's not determined by how much you need, or it's not determined by how much you get how much is left over after government takes whatever the heck it wants to take. It is your share of the mineral wealth, and and the Alaska PFD system is Alaska's version of, of the lower 48 of the way lower 48 royalties uh, right. are done. Mineral exactly. Royalties are done. It's and our it's share. Share yeah. of, of Alaskan share of, of those benefits. Right. And nobody, and, and all of these people on this tweet, all of these, uh, all of these people that talk about a reasonable PFD, they're not thinking about it that way anymore. It's, it's how much, how much can we give you after we've spent for government, Without us being taxed to, to, to pay for government, right? Exactly. It's all coming out of the all coming out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. All right. Well, let's move on. We want to get to this PICA thing because we've been trying to for the last four weeks. Let's talk about what's happening with PICA uh, and what does it mean for Alaska. So PICA is uh, for those who who don't it doesn't immediately come to mind. PICA is the next great prospect. Uh, on the North Slope. We have Prudhoe, we have Kaparik, uh, we have Alpine, we have uh, what Conoco is doing uh, out uh, to the west of, uh, or to, you know, to the west of Kaparik. Uh, but Pika is the next big development on the slope. It is uh, developed, it was developed by Armstrong Oil Company. He sold uh, the interest to Repsol, who owns a 49%. Repsol is a, a Spanish uh, oil and gas company. Uh, and oil search uh, owns the other uh, majority interest in it. Lost you for a second, Brad. I said after okay. after you said uh, uh, you said Repsol and then source uh, or excuse me, you said Repsol has the minority and somebody has the majority and you got locked up there. Okay, I'm sorry. Santos has Santos now has the majority, and and the question is, you know, you, is Pika going to go forward? And Santos has been saying very good things about it. Santos is the is the majority. Uh, owner now. Santos has been saying good, very good things about it. But in Santos's general meeting a few weeks ago, the chairman of Santos said this, the, the PICA is currently being progressed towards sanction ready by the middle of this year. That's a good thing. Value from the PICA project may be delivered through sell down per processes and or participation in project development, Spence, the chairman of Santos, told, uh, told shareholders. What that means is what, what Santos is really looking for to, to get out of PICA is to sell off a piece of it and get money in hand by selling off a piece of it. And, and the concern I have is comments like that, which I've seen before, comments like that mean we're not going to progress PICA. We're not going to put the cash it takes in to develop PICA until we get a partner in here, somebody else who will share in the risk sharing the financial burden of it and until we get you know some participation in it by a third party they've had the project on the market for a long time oil search had it on the market before santos took over oil search and they hadn't found any purchasers right 40 um, seconds and 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 i've got you know i've got a concern that santos is saying very good things about pika as as i would if i were trying to sell it uh they're saying very good things about pika but buried in underneath the very good things they're saying is this, but, which is, but in order to go forward, we need somebody else to come in with a bunch of money um, and buy buy a share of our interest and provide the money to go forward uh, and develop it. And until we get that, uh, we're going to keep saying good things about PICA because right, we're trying to sell it. But until we get that, we're not going to really go forward with the with the full Brad, uh, PICA Brad. development. That's a real that's a real concern. I mean, the Pika project is great. Hey, look, our project is good. It's going to provide a lot of good stuff, but we need a little cash to get things kick started and we're waiting for somebody else to pony up the cash. So, we could be in limbo and as you said, they've had this on the market for a while and nobody is uh and nobody is uh stepping up to the plate. So, this could be much ado about nothing, meaning they could be sitting on this for quite a while. Yep. Exactly right, Michael. And it's and you know and and the reason that affects Alaskans is a lot of I mean the if you look at the ten year plan or the ten year revenue forecast of, of what's you know, what's down the road in terms of Alaska part of the, the revenue to the state government part of it is driven by oil prices anticipation of higher oil prices 
uh, but a big part of it is driven by anticipation in, in, in production growth. And a big part of that production growth is driven by PICA. So to, to, to truly achieve, I mean, when you look at the governor's 10 year forecast, it's a, it's, a, it's a forecast of rising spending, moderate rises in spending, uh, paid for by moderate rises in, uh, in revenue, driven by oil prices and driven by production. If we don't have that production growth, um, then the 10-year forecast looks a lot worse uh, than, what he's, uh, than what the administration has out there right now. And so following PICA, I mean, uh, the development of PICA is a big part of, of keeping Alaska on, on track uh, for the sort of revenue growth that, that pays for the type of government uh, uh, that, uh, that, the, that the governor has, uh, has put out there. And I, and, and I just, I, I'm concerned that we're not fully understanding what's going on with PICA. And, and I'm concerned that we're gonna you know, wake up one day, oil search is never gonna have found a, a, an alternate purchaser. They're not prepared to go forward with their funding. It's not in their core area. Their core area is Australia and uh, and the, the, uh, the, the, the that part of Asia, uh, all search isn't prepared to go forward with it, and Pika just sort of sits there uh, without uh, without uh, going forward in terms of development. Well, we'll have to see what, how it all plays out, and of course, what we really need here is we need some leadership in this state, and unfortunately, we haven't really been receiving it, and that's uh, that's part of the part of the overall problem. All right, Keith Lee, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. We appreciate it, as always. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right, good to hear from you. We will talk with you again next week. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.